Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host, Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux Newslog is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. Let's go ahead and get into the uh, stories for this episode. Uh, over at pcauthority.com.au, OpenELEC 4.0 has been released, offers a simple XBMC 13 install for standalone devices. Those looking to build a low-cost, lightweight media server will be pleased to see that OpenELEC 4.0, 32-bit and 64-bit have been released. Uh, it's a complete Linux-based distribution based around XBMC that takes up a mere 125 megabytes thanks to the fact that it's designed specifically for running XBMC and nothing else, which I guess makes sense. Uh, version 4.0 includes the recently released XBMC 13.0 final and includes several under-the-hood changes of significance. So <clears throat> the build system has been completely reworked. It doesn't just fix outstanding issues, but makes it easier for the development team to add new features going forward. Um, it also leads to a simplified number of builds with specific builds for certain chipsets, including NVIDIA, ION, Intel, and Fusion, now removed, uh, with support rolled in to the generic 32-bit and 64-bit builds instead. So pretty cool. Definitely check it out. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you definitely, uh, you know, want to use if you just want a dedicated Linux-based uh, streaming player. Uh, from uh, VG247, full bore is now available on Steam, 10% off during the launch window. Full bore is a block puzzler with an exploratory twist that puts you on the hooves of a bore. Searching deep underground for a reminder of Borkind's darkest hours, the open world includes mines, ruins, technological wonders, secrets, and hidden rooms. It just arrived on Steam for Linux and PC. Um, and uh, so go ahead and grab it before it goes back up to $15. I thought I would share that since Linux gaming tends to be a little bit on the light side. From Muktware, uh, the open source magazine, possible Linux version for Grid Autosport Codemasters. Pretty neat. After the announcement regarding the beautiful Project Car support Linux, the racing scene on Linux seems to have got quite a bit of attention. Now add to the attention Codemasters. The developers behind the famous Grid series have just said that they are looking at Linux as a possible platform for their upcoming game, Grid Autosport. A Pretty neat game, if you ask me. It looks like it should be pretty cool. They've got some graphics there on the website. Pretty awesome. From itworld.com, AMD is committing to Android as it looks beyond Windows. After flirting with the idea for more than a year, Advanced Micro Devices has finally provided concrete details for bringing Android to its chips as the company looks to support more operating systems beyond Windows. What does this take the form of, you may ask? Well, it's funny you should mention that. So they're going to support Android on its 64-bit ARM-based chip starting next year. The company has said in a press conference where it announced Project Skybridge, a series of products that will provide the plumbing for its ARM and x86 cores to be interchanged or combined on a single motherboard. Pretty awesome. Uh... AMD is bringing Android only to the ARM architecture, not x86, which is used in Windows and Linux PCs. So uh, that's one thing. It will be for ARM only, but it'll be a 64-bit ARM. Uh, so hopefully you'll get you know a fair amount of the you know won't really lose much performance. So that's good. Uh, from searchstorage.techtarget.com, the Red Hat acquisition of Ink Tank beefs up its storage play. Uh, basically, they uh, bought uh, Ink Tank Storage Inc. It gives Red Hack a, a Red Hat, not Red Hack, <laughs> Red Hat, a block interface and bolsters its OpenStack integration. We talked about this briefly uh, 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 previously, and um, should be pretty interesting to see what happens as things uh, progress for them. So I'm curious to see. You know, storage is really where it's at at this point. Processing power is 
largely you know caught up n not necessarily on mobile devices but that's because they're just trying to get as much power per watt out of it uh, but you know on desktop type systems processing power for just about everything you want to do as a user desktop user processing power is, has has largely been you know not really that big of an issue you've we've been more io bound and keep the, the for the last 5 to 10 years the the major system upgrades that i've done on my personal computers were not faster cpus i mean you do get faster cpus as systems progress but when i have an existing system the first thing i consider upgrading is my storage because a bigger faster hard drive will make your computer feel like you got a new computer uh, the second thing after that is ram but typically when i build my systems i, I build them already where they have the most RAM that I can either afford at the time or they have the most RAM the motherboard supports. And so I build that combination where I buy the fastest CPU and the most, the most amount of RAM that I could afford or support at that time. And then over the next two to three years, my system upgrades consist of putting bigger, faster hard drives in it, in my systems, because a, they're either not fast enough or I run out of space. Like my my current main system that I have now, uh, my laptop uh, has a terabyte hard drive in it, and I've only got I've had it for just over a year now, and um, I've only got 260 gigs free or 250 gigs free, something like that. You know, another six months or so, I'm gonna I'm gonna be completely out of space, and I'm gonna be looking to upgrade. Uh, to a to another bigger hard drive so um and that's just how it is either that or take a bunch of stuff and offload it which i don't like doing because then i don't have it there on my laptop that's the whole point of having a laptop is you have all your stuff there so uh you know it's it's just one of those things um that you know <laughs> it's just one of those things the hard drives are where it's at you know bigger bigger hard drives you know it's uh, that's the primary thing that i upgrade nowadays is Bigger hard drive, bigger hard drive, bigger hard drive. Every time I do an upgrade, it almost inevitably, I'm always upgrading the hard drive before I upgrade everything else. And the hard drive, if you have enough RAM and a sufficient CPU, the hard drive makes a bigger difference in your system performance than almost anything else. So uh, anyway, enough about that. Uh, from ZDNet, Kernel Care, a new no reboot Linux patching system. That's right, a new no reboot Linux patching system. On a well maintained Linux system, months can go by without needing to reboot. Sooner or later, however, a security patch to the Linux kernel will require you to reboot your machine. This is from Stephen J. Von Nichols. Uh, not that uh, that's not a real problem on desktop, but when you're talking hundreds of servers, it can be a real pain. Yes, it can. Uh, that's where Cloud Linux's new program, Kernel Care, comes in. Cloud Linux, makers of the CentOS related Cloud Linux OS, a Linux distribution for hosting providers, claims that with Kernel Care, scheduled outages for security patches on Linux servers are now a thing of the past, giving organizations real time updates. The program automatically applies Linux server security updates without having to reboot. This frees technical personnel from the laborious process that takes several minutes for every server several times a year. So uh, pretty interesting uh, technology. Um, you know, kind of makes you wonder why this isn't built directly into most distributions, but I, it's, I guess it's just one of those things. From Muktware again, uh, Linux, uh, Lenovo launches two Chromebooks. Pretty neat. The world's leading PC maker, Lenovo, has also joined the Linux bandwagon and launched two, uh, or launched its first Linux-powered Chromebook for consumer space. Earlier, they offered Chromebooks for education. Well, now you can buy them if you are any old buddy. Uh, they have announced the N20 and the N20P. They are identical, except the N20P offers a touchscreen display, and its keyboard can flex 300 degrees backwards to convert from laptop mode to stand mode, so users can use the 10-finger touchscreen to consume content. It's definitely a great device for content consumption as well as creation. Um, should be pretty interesting to see uh, what they do with it. That will do it for this edition of Linux News Log. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com or if you're watching on YouTube, 
uh, right here underneath the uh, video, you should see the uh, show notes there, and you can find the links for those in the show notes there as well. Uh, for, if you have not already subscribed, please do so. If you have, thank you for subscribing, and uh, you can email me at linux at quicksurf.com. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. See you then. Bye.